please turn to Matthew chapter 6. I was reminded of an old song, and I think, I think Pastor Larry and Rick could probably help me out that brokenness, brokenness is what I long for. You guys know that song? Brokenness is what I need, right? Brokenness, brokenness is what you want from me. And then, he, and then the, the uh, best part, right? Take my heart, right? And form it. See, you guys know it. Transform it. Take my will. Form it. To yours. To yours. Oh, Lord. Amen. There's nothing wrong with admitting that you're broken. There's nothing wrong with admitting that you got some problems. Nothing wrong admitting that you're not perfect. When you come to the Lord and you be honest with him and you let him know where you're at. God is so faithful that he will meet us where we're at when we will be humble and honest with him. Isn't that great? We're not always feeling awesome. Oftentimes we might feel discouraged, we might feel broken, might feel lost, might feel like a failure. Maybe we made too many mistakes this week. But if we, if we come to the Lord and we're honest with him, isn't it great? We can get it right. We can make it right with God. And he's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. If we, if we could just accept it. That's the problem. The, the problem is not that God wasn't powerful enough to do it. It's that we struggle with being able to receive it. The enemy is a sneaky deceiver. He's a consistent liar. He's a defeated enemy that wants to put defeat on all of us. So that we won't walk in what the word of God already says that we're all conquerors in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine that for a moment? Because some of you can't see that. So let's just take a moment and just see that for a moment. That when you look in the mirror, what the Lord sees is victory. He sees something, to, someone to be proud of. He sees somebody that he loves and he likes to be with. See, we, we see our mistakes, we see our sin, we see our trouble. God looks at us as, man, that's my child. I love that person. That person is special to me. And so when, when, when we come to God and we say, God, I'm this and I'm that, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not, that's not what I see. How is that possible? It's one of the reasons why he went to the cross. God sees us differently because of the blood that was shed by his son. Because his blood covers what? A multitude of sins. Don't let the devil lie to you. I love it. I could feel the contention today. I could feel the spiritual tension in the atmosphere. And I, I don't mind it. Because it confirms that the Lord is up to something and the enemy doesn't like it. The enemy, do you, do you think the enemy is just going to sit back comfortably in a lazy boy while you get healed and delivered and have your life changed for the purpose of the kingdom of God? You think the enemy is just going to kick back and let that happen? You should expect adversity. You should expect things to get difficult. You should expect things to go a little bit sideways and haywire. Whoever told you that when you become a Christian, it's just easy street, definitely lied to you. It always gets worse before it gets better. You can expect 
things to come against you, but you should also expect that everything's going to work out for your good according to God. Just like Pastor Bill said, he answers. He doesn't always answer what we want, but he always answers because God always knows. The Bible says he knows what you need before you even ask him, but he still puts a requirement on us to ask him. Why is that? Because in order to ask him, you have no way but to humble yourself. You can't ask somebody for something without humbling yourself first. Because you're acknowledging that you don't have it and you can't provide it for yourself, so you got to ask someone else. And God likes us to be reminded, he likes us to know that he's the one that's in control. That he's the one that can come through. He, the breakthrough comes from him. He is a faithful provider of everything that we need. I was reminded this morning of the story of Job and how the enemy went before God and he said, you know, God said, have you considered my servant Job? And, and he said, let me have my way with him and I bet you he'll curse you. How awesome is that, that God had enough confidence in Job to say, yeah, let's see. Let's see about that because he won't. He said, go ahead and have your way with him, but he wouldn't let him kill him. And the, the enemy definitely had his way with him. It said that Job lost everything. He lost everything. And you know, his, some of his friends, they even, they even were trying to figure out what was wrong. And you, you know, you got them too. You got friends, you, you know, let me, let me just go ahead for a minute. It's not even in there. But Jose, you ain't going to find these notes up there, okay? So some of his friends go in on him. Well, Job, maybe it's because you did this. Or maybe it's because of that. And who knows, maybe they were trying to be good friends and trying to help him figure it out. Do you know that sometimes you go through stuff and it's not worth any energy to try to figure it out? Because it ain't about figuring it out. That's not it. Don't put the energy in trying to figure out why you got to go through something. Put the energy into holding on to your faith in God, knowing that whatever you go through, he's in it with you, and he's going to bring you right out. Don't sit there and rack your brain about this and that. So his friends, they're trying to do the best they can, which the best thing they could have done was just pray for him and stop talking so much. And that's what we, you know what? We need to be able to tell some friends and family that sometimes, that, hey, just shut it. I don't need to hear it. Just pray for me. I, I don't need your advice. No? Okay, I know you say you have a word. I don't want to hear it. If God's got a word for me, I'll let him talk to me. I'm in a difficult season. I'm tired of all y'all chatting me up. And sometimes you need to do that. and You just need to have business with you and God. Sometimes you got to. God spoke to Job and said, Job, who are you to question me? Who were you to question me? Where were you when I created all of this? Where were you when I did all of this, when I put all this in place? And then God rebuked a couple of the dudes and said, so you think you can speak for me? Come on. We put in the name prophet on a lot of people who don't deserve that title. Just because somebody feels something don't necessarily mean it's a prophetic word. That's why everything needs to be taken to the word of God. Sometimes people just feel an urge and want to say something. That's not good enough. Listen, I'm sorry, but I live according to that word. I'm not going off of people's prophetic words. I ain't doing that. I'm not saying that I don't believe in the gift because just like this morning, I encourage, I said, Bill, minister. Because if you have the gift and if the Holy Spirit uses you in that way, I'm like, go for it. You got a word, give it. 
But I don't let everybody give a word because not everybody should. But there are elders and pastors that I trust that when they speak, I listen. Because I know them. Because they're tried. They have experience, years of experience. They've been walking with God. They went through stuff, so they got substance. They got fortitude in their faith, so I want to listen to them. We come from a culture way back in the day in a Pentecostal church called Sunnyside Foursquare Church where people would move in the spirit of God. And people like me and people like some of y'all went to that church because we knew there was something special there. Because there was some special pastors and leaders anointed by the Holy Ghost. And because of that, the Lord allowed a special movement of grace in that, in that congregation. And many churches and ministries became birthed out of that church. Because Pastor Jerry is a legend. Yes. Amen. And his wife a legend. But there have been many ministries and churches that have come out of that. And many of them have tried to reproduce the special thing that God was doing at Sunnyside. And so many people, because of, of different reasons and brokenness, people left the church and they scattered. And when they did, they left hurt, broken and disappointed, trying to recreate the experience that was at Sunnyside Foursquare Church. That was for that season and for that time. And I'm telling you right now that God is unleashing something special for this time. It's not about the name of the church or the people, it's about the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And he is still doing what he does with anyone who would accept it and receive it and allow him to move. And in this church, we like to allow the Holy Spirit to move. But I wanna tell you something, you have a pastor and you have a preacher that is not chasing after experiences. I don't chase after names. I don't chase after experiences. I don't feel like I got to go to everybody's conference that thinks I should be at it. I don't go flying all over the states and all over the countries to try to get this and that from somebody. If I got something I need to get, I know where I need to go to get it. I know where I got to go. I'm not worshiping other leaders and other pastors. I'm not worshiping these musicians and all. I don't feel like we need to have any of that stuff. We need God. We need to get back to the good old-fashioned presence of the Lord and the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God is strong and powerful enough to break every single chain of the enemy. I have seen the power and the authority of the Word of God manifested in special ways and even through people who are little kids. Because if you know the word and you know God, then you will know authority. But I can't know it through someone else. I've got to know it for myself. The word of God is true. And God is faithful to his word. If you really, if you really pay attention, and if you really focus and try to see, you'll see that God is already at work you'll see that there is already a movement. You don't have to go looking for one or asking for God to do one. He's doing one right now. And some of you in this room, you're the movement. You're asking God for someone else and this, and God's looking at you saying, I'm waiting on you to be ready because the next movement I want to do in your family or in your community is in you. God, why is this being held up? You. Did you know that? Did you know that God can choose someone to do something and it won't happen until you say yes to the Lord? Because that's what he's chosen to do. We serve a good God. And we need to be reminded of that. Because the enemy will try to get you to turn against God, turn against yourself, turn against the church, turn against your family, and that's all a work of the devil. There's nothing holy about that. There's nothing good and godly about it. I, I don't care in what capacity it is in your life. If you find yourself wanting to get divided against somebody, I'm going to tell you right now, that's the devil 
and you can sit here and koromo shanda adam and all this kind of stuff, and you can prophesy and all this stuff. And if you're going to allow that division in your life, how are you going to let the devil work in and through your life and then sit here and try to prophesy at the same time? Sit here and try to act all spiritual at the same time. Ain't nobody care about how many scriptures you got memorized if you ain't going to live it right. What kind of person are we if, if, we, if we can come in here and, 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 and praise it and shake it and thump it, and then everywhere else we're at, people are looking at us like we're the hot mess express? Nope. Listen, I don't, I don't want to raise up a generation and a church family of people who are going to function like that. I don't think that's what we're supposed to do. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not about trying to preach people happy. I'm not trying to earn your tithe and your offering by the way that I preach. I can care less what you think about my preaching. I care a whole lot more about the Lord looking at me on judgment day and saying, Alpha, you did what I wanted you to do. I care a whole lot more about that. If you notice, when, when, when we have people come up here and preach, guests that I invite, some of the elders and the pastors that you see in this room, when they come up here, they preach the word of God. And everyone's got different styles. This is mine. And I don't expect nobody to mimic or copy or be like me. I don't want nobody to be dressing like me, talking like me. There's other churches that do that stuff. That ain't going to happen here. But there's an expectation. There's an expectation. And, and all these people, whoever come up here, they always meet that expectation. And that's this, that you know and can properly deliver the word of truth out of God's word. I don't care how animated you are or, or whatever. It, it would help if you're not boring, my goodness. But, <laughs> right? But what I pay attention to and what most of you pay attention to is that you're, you're hearing and you're learning something that is the truth of God's word. Because you see that there's value in it and there's power in it. And it is truly what changes your life. If the only worship experience you get in your life is when you come here on Sunday... I'm going to tell you right now, you ain't doing it right. If the only kind of sound teaching that you get is when you come here on Sunday morning, I'm going to tell you right now, you're not doing it right. You're not living it right. You, you got you, you to gotta be having this happening in your life as much as you can daily. Try and make it happen daily. Daily, folks. And as you get in the word, and if you have questions, there's at least 30 elders and pastors in this little church that can answer your questions. Pastor, I was reading this, or, you know, elder or leader. I don't, we're not into the titles, but hey, I was reading this. I can't understand it. Can you help me understand what this word means or what was the context of the scripture? I don't get it. But ask the questions. I'm tired of people telling, you know, can I just go off for a minute? I'm tired of people telling me I don't read the Bible because I can't understand it. Ask. Ask. Do you go, do you go, you know, I'm starving. I haven't eaten for 50 days, but I can't figure out how to turn the stove on. <laughs> Guess what you're going to do? You're going to figure out how to get some food in you. Some of it is some good old, I don't know what happened. We lost it. So there's some good old fashioned figure it out. You ever heard of that before? You can figure out an iPhone, but you can't figure out how to understand some basic principles of the Bible. You can Google it for crying. You can, you don't even have to carry a Greek lexicon. You can go to Google and Google will tell you what the Greek word is, what the Hebrew word is. My goodness. Do I, and then we got AI doing everything for, I don't even want to, no, let's go. Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. And you know what, church? We need to be praying. The election's coming. 
And many people are different on who they want to vote for. But I'm going to tell you something. We need to pray. We need an honest, we need an honest election. And we need to pray that who becomes the next leader is someone that God wants there. And most importantly, we need to pray that America comes back to Jesus. That's the most important thing. I'm going to tell you, no matter who's president, if America doesn't get right with God, we're going to continue to go down, down, down. Listen, even if the money got right, if people's hearts aren't getting right, America is going to continue to decline, decline, decline. I vote for Jesus. Come on. I vote for Jesus to come back to America. So pray, pray about it. You know, I, I know that, that some people are like, well, I'm not even going to vote. I'm, I'm, hey, I, I appreciate that, but just hold on a second. Because I want to make sure that we understand we're not going to let political views divide the body of Christ. Okay? I'm going to vote. I'm going to encourage all of you to vote. But if you say I'm not going to for whatever reason, guess what? I still love you. You're still my brother and sister. And I'm not going to spend no time fighting with you about it. But I'm going to remind you that people died for that right. Okay? And listen, if I didn't like being an American, then I wouldn't live here. But I am an American. I was born in Tampa, Florida on the Naval Air Force Base. I'm a military brat. You understand? I believe in, in being <laughs> proud about being an American. But I am more proud about being a believer. Have you been to other parts of the world? Thank God we live in America. Thank God. It ain't that great everywhere else, y'all. It's not. If you could have just been where I was at in Africa this year, in the city of, in the city of Kalalushi, you'd be like, when can I go home? And we struggle to just tell people about Jesus here? They won't kill you here for that yet. Matthew chapter 6, and uh, I've been in this message series about the Lord's Prayer. And we're in message number 3, where we're going to talk about give us this day our daily bread. Amen? So let's just go ahead and read starting at verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Makes sense. I don't like it when people do that to me either. Obviously, God doesn't like it. Repetitive words. Do you, do you know what he's talking about? Because people practice it in other religions. They mumble a bunch of the same words over and over again, thinking that because of the multiple times they say it, that God's going to respond to it. The Bible says he's not responding to that. And what, what did he say? Heathens do that. Am I saying that? No. God's word says that. Well, that's offensive. God's word can be offensive. And like I said last week, right? God will continue to offend us until there's not anything to be offended about anymore. So in this manner... I'm sorry, he said, verse 8, Therefore don't be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So verse 9, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, which that's going to be next week. So if y'all don't want to get real, you might not want to come to church next Sunday. Verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14, 
For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. Lord's prayer in that right there all together. That's, that's, that's enough. We can spend probably six months on that, right? It'd be good for us. So today I want to focus on uh, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. What is the meaning of the word bread in this prayer? Well, the Hebrew word for bread is lechem, and I'm probably not saying it right. But that's the Hebrew word for it. The first appearance of this word is in Genesis 3.19, and there the Lord is explaining the consequences of the fall of Adam, and he says, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So God lets man know that he will live by bread until his death. It is only a temporary source of life for him. Essentially, he eats bread only to die in the end. That is why Jesus came to bring life and life more abundantly. If it wasn't for Jesus, that's all you would have to live for. As a matter of fact, I want to go ahead and say something here, is that if your life is all about going to work and getting a paycheck and coming home and that's all your life is, I, I feel bad for you. Because that's not what life is supposed to just be. If you didn't have Jesus, I guess it would make sense that that's what your life would be. But Jesus said, I came to give life and life abundantly. We need bread physically, but we need spiritual bread as well. And emotionally, we are provided for when both the physical and the spiritual are taken care of properly. I want to say properly. See, when you are being fed and nourished physically and spiritually, now you can address emotionally. What is the world's method? Physically and emotionally to lead to the spiritually. Oops. Not the right way to do it. Everyone's hungry for the bread of heaven. We need physical bread. We need spiritual bread. Physical bread. God, God provides for us. Do you believe that? God is our provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. Amen? Our provision comes from him. The fruit of our work is because he provided that work for us. We must be thankful for his provisions in our life, including having work to do. Bread is a metaphor for food, sustenance, and provision. He promises to provide for our needs if he is first in our lives. God promises to provide if God is number one. He doesn't promise to provide if he's number 10 or he's at the bottom of the barrel. He only promises provision if he's number one. Well, God promises to take care of me if he's number one. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. Amen? Amen. So is God first in your life? Where does God fit on your daily list of priorities? How do you thank God for his provisions? How do you respond and thank God with your life for his provisions? Do you say, Thank you, Lord. When you get a paycheck, do you say, Lord, thank you for my paycheck? You think I'm joking? I do it every day. Every day that I get a job at my shop and we get paid, I say, God, thank you. Thank you, God, for this provision. When somebody gives me a gift and says, hey, Alpha, I just want to bless you and your wife, I say, God, thank you. Every time. Every time when somebody says, hey, I just want to give you a discount. God, thank you. You know Christians, they always look for discounts. I want to ask you this. Do you, do you return back to God at least 10% by giving towards his kingdom and his purposes? Not giving to Alpha giving towards his kingdom and his purposes. Do you, do you hoard your money like it's some kind of security for you? 
Or when you see that God provides for you, do you take some of that money and say, God, I want to give it back to you. Where would you like it to go? Lord, I want to, I want to give to my local church and support the church, Lord. Lord, I want to support missions. God, I want to help that family over there that I know needs some supplies. They need some food. I want to go help them. Are you a giver? And are you generous with your giving? Can you be generous with what God has provided for you? I would encourage you, get rid of the spirit of stingy. Because listen, if you're stingy, if you're stingy, you're either selfish or you're afraid. You're afraid that you're not going to get provided for, or you're just selfish. You're like, I want, to get, I want to get what I want. Other people need to figure it out. I'm getting what I want. Okay? And I want to ask you this. Do you gladly worship the Lord? You know, because there's many reasons to worship God, and one of them is, you know what, God? You always take care of me. You always take care of me. You always take care of my family. God, I worship you. Worship him. Amen. You can use, you can use your work. You can use your talent, and your gifts. You can use your finances and worship God with it. I remember one time I was sitting in this big old church. I went to this conference. It was a youth conference. I brought my youth group and there's like 5,000 people there, youth pastors, youth leaders, and, and teenagers. And I remember that there was an announcement being made that one of the youth pastors, that him and his family was going to leave to go plant a church. And so they wanted to do an offering for this youth pastor. And immediately in my head, I said, you know what? This youth pastor comes from a huge church with a lot of money. They don't need my money. They got plenty of money. And the Holy Spirit said, give $100. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> and the Lord said, do you want me to bless what you do? Then you're going to bless what I'm doing in him. I said, okay, Lord. And at that time, $100 was like, might as well have been $1,000. We, we got to be generous. We got to trust God. We got to do what the Lord tells us to do with the resources he gives us. Money's just a tool. Everything here is temporary. Right? And everything that we have, we should hold loosely and let the Lord do with it what he wants. If he says, go ahead and give this person your truck or go ahead and do this and that, who are we to argue with God? Just do what the Lord says. Trust him because he's going to take care of you no matter what it is. Maybe you got a nice pair of shoes and God says, go give him your shoes. Give him the shoes. I have a friend in Atlanta and God uses him this way. He'll wear brand new shoes. He's a shoe collector. He's probably got two closets full of shoes. That's it, just shoes in it. And he'll, he'll go and he'll do street ministry, okay? He'll go hit the streets with the city takers. He'll do street ministry. He does it a lot of times, all the time. And, and he goes out there and he works hard for his money. Okay, he works hard. He's not a full-time paid minister. He's not raising funds and, and li living high off the hog or anything like that. He didn't win the lottery or nothing. He goes to work like many of us, gets a paycheck, pays his bills. And one of the things he likes to do is buy nice shoes. Shoes that are anywhere from $50 to $250 a pair. And he'll go hit the streets and he goes out there and he's willing. He's looking for who do you want me to give my shoes to today? And he wears them and he takes them off and he gives it to them and he walks around barefoot the rest of the day. Why? To remind himself that you're not too good and to be able to be a giver and give what you like and what you love and be willing to give it to other people. And he, and he purposely looks for people on the street to give it to. He doesn't sit there and go, well, they're just smoking meth all the time, God. Why do they, you know, they're choosing to be out here, God. He doesn't do that. He just said, whatever, whoever the Holy Spirit highlights, he goes, you're about to get some shoes today. He, he does it to keep everything in its proper place in his heart. Jesus is the bread of heaven for us. Not only does he provide for our physical needs, he supplies our spiritual needs from salvation all the way through to the innermost parts of who we are. 
those innermost parts that need transformation and need healing that can only come from him. Jesus truly is life for us. He's real life for us. Jesus is the word that we need daily in our life. When we spend time in his word, we are spending time with Jesus. We are feeding ourselves the spiritual food that we need when we spend time in the word with Jesus. And I want to ask you something. Is anyone spiritually starving today or are you full? Are you walking in the fullness of God or are you walking in malnourishment? Because malnourished people have very weak faith. Feed on the word of God. Don't just snack on it. Don't just snack on it, but feed on it. But go ahead and snack on it too. <laughs> feed on it and snack on it. Don't just snack on it. Don't go on your phone for three minutes and look at a YouTube short of somebody saying one scripture and tell everybody you did your devotions today. You're snacking. You're snacking. You see, when it comes to this prayer tent on Halloween, this, this holiday that the, that, that the devil claims for himself, I don't want you in that prayer tent if all you do is snack because you're not ready to deal with what might come into that tent. You come and be a part of that team if you know that you're equipped and ready to really pray and intercede for people and believe God to deliver people that night. I think it would be a beautiful thing to see people get delivered from evil spirits on the devil's holiday. Don't get worried about me saying, oh, here's another pastor trying to do this stuff on Halloween. Let me tell you something. I can care less about celebrating a Halloween. I want to impact people's life, and I'm willing to go where they're at. And they're out here. Two to 300 people within two hours in this neighborhood are right here. I would be an idiot as a pastor and evangelist to not take advantage of an opportunity of people coming right in front of the house. So come and play the little games and come check out our, our decorated trunk. But I want to pray for you. I got a sweatshirt that says something about how can I pray for you today. And, you know, I'm going to wear it. And I'm going to walk around looking at all these people dressed like witches and warlocks and glorifying all of this evil stuff. And I'm going to say, hey, can I pray for you? God bless you. Can I pray with you? I want you to know how much God loves you. I want to pray with you. And I'm, every time I pray for somebody, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, do you have a word that I can give them? Is there something, God, that you can show me, a color or a picture or a word or something that I can speak to them to let them know that you're real and that you're better than the devil? Come on, the world needs to know that God is better than the devil. And how are we going to do that if we just... If we just turn our nose at people out of religion or whatever, come on, God goes after people. He, he pursues people who are so lost. I would love it if somebody who was a satanic priest got saved on Halloween. I would love it if somebody who came into this church to try to put a curse on me ended up getting saved in this church. I'm not worried about the curses. I ain't worried about the spirits in this neighbor. I ain't worried about none of that stuff because greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. I know the scripture. My grandma taught me that scripture when I was like 10 years old. 10 years old. One of the first scriptures I memorized because of her. Why is that? Because God was getting me ready. He was getting me ready. Come on, and y'all need to get ready. Come on, you, you get consumed. You get consumed about the stuff in your life, about your job and, and the drama and all this stuff, and it, it's distracting you when God is saying, hey, it's time to get in the battlefield. It's time. Why are you getting hit with that depression so much? Because the evil spirit's trying to suppress you? Because you're too powerful. Because you're called to be powerful. Why are you wrestling with that addiction? Why are you wrestling with that habit? Because you're powerful and the devil's trying to disarm you. Why? Because we're in the time. We're in the season where God is calling warriors to fight, to fight in the spirit. Fighting in the spirit. 
The devil doesn't care how polished and shiny we are. He cares about if you're somebody that threatens his kingdom. He'll do anything that he can to get you so distracted that you won't enter the battlefield. And what are you supposed to do in that battlefield? Be a witness and be an intercessor. Sometimes you don't need to say nothing. You just need to be praying. When you're praying, I don't know if you can feel it, but I can feel stuff in the spiritual atmosphere wherever I'm at. I don't know if you can or not, but I do. And guess what? The enemy knows it. He knows when there's a praying church. He knows when there's praying people. He can't stand it. So why is he attacking you? Why is he coming against you and your spouse? Why, why is there so much trouble amongst your young people, your children, and your house? Because the enemy knows you're a threat. You're a threat. Don't let the enemy get you consumed into this worldly stuff. Don't get consumed in it. It's a distraction. It's a diversion. While you're distracted with all of this mess that's in, in your face, the enemy's working things in the background, trying to take your legs out from underneath you. Don't let him distract you. When I sensed what the enemy was trying to do, I started to smile and I started to cry. Because I wasn't worried about the enemy I was looking forward to what God was going to do. And then Pastor Bill came up here and started prophesying. I'm telling you, I'm fully confident in my God. I ain't worried about the devil. I'm confident in God. He comes through every time. I've got this attitude of just watch, like, hey, just watch him. Just watch him. He's going to do it, watch. That's how I am. That's how I have to be. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The word of God, it's spiritual power in our lives, right? Hebrews 4.12. It is power. It's not just words on a page. So many people are trying to discredit the word of God. People in the quote-unquote Christian community are trying to discredit the word of God. If you, if you were wondering, if you were confused, or if you weren't sure about where Revolution Church stands on the word of God, it is absolute truth for us. It is infallible, and it is still good for correction and rebuke and instruction. It is life for us. It is instruction for us, and we build our lives upon it. That's how we are. We're, we're not saying it's just a historical document. It's, it, it's, it's all metaphors and it's all imagery. We don't say that. We don't believe that. If you believe differently, either line up with where we're at or find another church to go to. Because we're not changing that. The word also helps clean us. Did you know that? If, if you ever struggle with like, man, I'm just, I just feel so unclean or I've, I've looked at things or I've listened to things and I just feel so dirty, guess what? I'm going to tell you how to get cleaned up. It's right here. Ephesians 5.26. The washing by the water of the word of God. Okay? The word of God will help clean us up. Isn't that awesome? God's word will help clean you up. You got some sickness in your heart. You got an attitude issue. God's word will help clean you up, right? Come on. The word is our light for our path in life. Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and it is a light unto my path. Man, if you're like, man, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what direction. The Bible says that it's a light. It's a lamp. Come on, it's your, it's your Google map. Come on, if you're from the old school, it's, it's your map quest. I don't know what to do, God's word, because Jesus knows what to do. He always knows what to do. Jesus is never confused about direction. Our faith depends on the consuming of his word, Romans 10, 17. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. My grandma would tell me, she'd say, Alpha, when, when you read the word, 
you should also read it out loud because faith comes by hearing. Man, I'm telling you, because this, these are skills I learned from memorization. Did you know that? You memorize really well if you speak it and read it at the same time and write it. Did you know that? You will build memorization skills. I learned this when I was really, really young. Why? Because I wanted the candy. Come on, is there any old school Sunday schoolers in here? You remember, do you remember when you were in elementary school and they said that they'll give you Bible bucks or they'll give you candy for every scripture you memorize? Do you remember that? Okay, all you Sunday schoolers, you remember that? I remember that. And I'm going to tell you something. I was getting my prize. And then my grandmother put us in Christian school, and they said, you have to memorize these verses in order to get a passing grade in your Bible class. I said, I got that in the bag. I already got half of those memorized already. I love it because the word of God has been saturated in my life since I was young. I've been covered in it, smothered in it bathed in it. I'm going to tell you something. I thank God for it because it set me free. The word of God is the basis for truth. John 17, 17, Jesus is praying and he's interceding for us. And he says, father, your word is truth. Church, his word is truth. If you don't believe God's word is truth for you, then I, I feel bad for you because you're probably really unstable. You're probably struggling on how to, how to figure it out and how to make it because you don't have a basis for truth. Our basis for truth is the word of God. We don't get to have our truth. Well, this is my truth. Don't, please. I don't want no conflict with you. Don't bring that to me. I don't want to talk about it. I don't. If that's where you're at, I don't want to talk about it. We're not going to agree. I don't want to fight. I'll respect you where you're at. Respect me where I'm at. God's word is truth. I, I don't even want Alpha's truth. I don't want my truth. I want his truth. My truth has to line up with his truth. Or I'm just a hot mess express and I can't afford that no more. I've made enough mess in my life. I don't want to make no more. The word is our sword for battle. And this is important to know, Ephesians 6, 17. It's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You've got your, your faith shield in one and you've got your sword in the other. And so the word of God is not only for memorizing it and knowing and understanding, it's also to be used as a weapon against the forces of evil. Guys, the word of God is a weapon against the enemy. Come on, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. God, give us this day the weapon of mass destruction. The word of God. Bread's a common staple. It is commonly consumed among many cultures as a means for sustenance. Many start their day with some form of bread as a part of their meal. How about the heavenly bread? What if we treated the heavenly bread like common bread? What if we consumed the true bread of heaven every day? In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is helping us confess our dependence upon God for our daily means of survival and ability to get through each day. Think about that. God, I need you to get through each day. If you feel like you're just trying to get through on your own, don't do that because you don't have to. He says he'll give you what you need to get through. Acknowledge the fact that our provision comes from God. Spiritual provision, physical provision, emotional provision. Your emotional provision is not supposed to come from another person. Selah. 
We're going to say law on that. Married or unmarried. The emotional provision that we need is not supposed to come from another person. It comes from a good father. The only good father. That's where it comes from. And with his help, we'll enter into relationships already whole so that we don't need someone to make us whole. We're not able to function as our regenerated selves without God. The Holy Spirit does a process in us when we become Christians. We become followers of Christ called regeneration. It goes hand in hand. The Holy Spirit and the word of God in our life regenerates us. We can't do that without God. We can't do that without the bread of heaven. John 6, 48 through 51, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and we have our being. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's good news. We need Jesus, the bread of life, in order to live like Jesus commanded us to live. Moses said, he said it first, and then Jesus quoted it in defeating Satan during his 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. Do you guys know what it is? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8.3, Moses said, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We literally defeat Satan with the bread of life, with the word of God. When we read Matthew chapter 4, and we read the story of Jesus being tempted, we can see the excellent example that Jesus set for us when the enemy came to encounter him. And what did he do? He used the word of God to slap the devil in the face and send him out of the wilderness. That's what he did. Every temptation that he brought before Jesus and said, I will do this for you and I will give that for you. What was the first temptation? Take these stones and turn them into what? Don't tell me that's a coincidence. And what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And what did he tell him? He said, get behind me. Do y'all see that? Why is the devil standing in front of you? That's what you're supposed to do. When the devil's standing in front of you, you're supposed to say, get behind me. You don't belong in front of me. You're not allowed to be in front of me. You're not supposed to be in my way. Get behind me. And are you supposed to spend your life looking back? He's supposed to be back there. You ain't got no reason looking at him. You go forward. The apostle Paul said, I press on. He didn't say, I keep looking backward. The Bible says anyone who looks back with their hands on the plow is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Asking God for daily provision keeps us humble. And you know what? Humble we must be. And I think all of us could 
use a good shot of humble. You go get your espresso shot, take a humble shot right there with it. <laughs> Lord, give us this day our daily food. Lord, give us this day our daily focus. Lord, give us this day our daily power. Lord, give us this day our daily clarity. Lord, give us this day daily alignment. Lord, give us this day our daily finances. Lord, give us this day our daily wisdom. Would you stand with me as we pray? The daily bread is not just about food. It's, it's not, it's, it's everything that we see in the Bible isn't it true? It's so much deeper than what we just look at on the surface level. Yes. Jesus meant something heavy when he said, give us this day our daily bread. It wasn't just this thing to just let blow over our heads. He's basically saying, you're coming to God and you're acknowledging that everything that you need to live comes from God. That's what he meant by it. Everything you, eh, listen, everything, 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 the stuff in your heart, the stuff that you're hurt about, the stuff that you're confused about, the direction you're looking for, everything is provided by God. The money that you need, the, the, the next place that you need to live, you're looking for a place to live or something's going on with your car. Listen, everything you need, Everything you need is this daily bread. Everything. The healing. The confidence. Everything. Everything. It comes from Him. Is there anybody in the house today that doesn't know Jesus? I want to pray with you first. Anybody here does not know Jesus and needs to get saved? Is there anybody here, you say, man, I'm, I, I want to tell you something, man. I admit I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus. I need Jesus to save me and set me free. Just lift your hand up where you're at. Sir, are you raising your hand? Okay. Anybody else? If you guys see someone, let me know, because we want to pray with them, okay? How many of you by just waving your hand at me. Say, man, I know, I know that the Lord is the one who gives me my daily bread. How many of you know that? You know that? Are you going to start eating that bread? You're going to start taking that heavenly bread, right? Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would help us, Lord, to really get it, to really understand it. We confess to you, Lord, that we need daily bread from you. It's not enough to try to do it in our own strength. It's not enough to try to get bread from somewhere else or something else or some. It, Lord, it all comes from you. We need the heavenly bread. We need to be consuming the word of God. Lord, everything that we need for our life, we, we confess to you. We, we get it from you. We need it from you. So we say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. We thank you for your provision. Thank you, Lord, that you're always faithful. And thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, Revolution Church. Come on, praise the Lord. We'll see you all again next week. Have fun at all the midweek stuff, the home groups, the prayer groups, the worship services, the, all the other things going on around here. Have a good time. Friday night, ladies night.